trying to get the uh, participants It's all list. starting. Okay, well, welcome to the March 23rd, 2021 session of Tangerine SDR and Hamsai uh, Technical uh, Talk on Monday nights. My name is Dave, KV0S, and I attended the uh, Hamsai workshop. I uh, had to step out a few times to de deal with chores and stuff, but uh, got to see all, actually I've gotten to see all the talks now because I went back and watched the ones that I missed. So that was one thing. And I also worked on the uh, simulator. I got over my uh, problem with uh, getting the first tangerine programmer working. So it it discovers and this the simula radio simulator sends back port B now. So I'm uh, moving on to working on sending uh, data packets back and forth to with CRC checks to get that code working. So that's my next project. So that's it for me. Uh, next on the list is Nathaniel uh, W2NAF, go ahead. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, it's been a busy weekend for me. Uh, I also attended the HamSci workshop and did uh, quite a bit along with that, running it, organizing it, I was very happy with it. I thought everyone did a fantastic job. I'm very grateful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. There you have back to that. Dave, are you there? Look, his video is frozen. Yeah, he does have that frozen look. Yeah, all right. Well, I guess I'll take over the net then until he comes back. So um, I guess, Next, let's go to Greg Popolis. Thanks, Nathaniel. Nothing to really add, just uh, kudos to you and your team on a great job on the weekend. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Dave McGaw, N1HAC. Hello there. Yeah, great conference. And um, yeah, it's great to be, to participate and um, Trade information. I like the uh, the um, poster sessions because they really got conversation going. Uh, it wasn't just a one way uh, talks, um, though the talks were great and uh, I thought they went really well. Um, I like the uh, um, theme of mid latitude aurora because that's what I keep telling Jim mm. LaBelle. You know, why aren't we studying here? <laughs> and I know that uh, um, this whole project uh, will encourage that because that's where mm. these instruments are primarily going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm looking forward to the surprises mm -hmm. um, because I know that, uh, you know, we hams have seen a lot of things that uh, we professionals haven't accounted for. Mm. Um, other than that, I've been working at uh, Wallops um, putting our um, BLF propagation sounding rocket together. Um, mm -hmm. My instruments that I'm responsible for together, we've got uh, some that uh, you fix one thing, you break another. Mm -hmm. um, so we're a little delayed, but getting moving ahead on that. Um, and again, the uh, uh, you know what we're doing, it's it's picking up a. a signal of opportunity it happens to be a megawatt transmitter over in maine but <laughs> right primarily but uh follows the same kind of ideas so i'm uh, i guess i'll uh, give it back to net thanks a lot i guess i can hand it back over to dave larson yeah can you hear me mm -hmm. yeah we've had greg and uh dave uh, david mcgaw go so far yes um so next on the list is Bill, AB4EJ. Go ahead, Bill. Thanks, Dave. Sorry to be a few minutes late. I had 
uh, cooking dinner duties uh, this evening and uh, ran a little bit over, but uh, uh, I must say I enjoyed the conference very much. I yeah, learned a lot, got a lot of ideas for some new things to look into. As far as what I've accomplished recently, uh, what I have is I have the grape uh, running GNU radio with its waterfall and ne right next to it on another screen, uh, the tangerine, of course, running with the simulated data engine and comparing them to see how they compare and uh, trying to see, you know, what, what is the differences between what we observe in one and the other. Also, I've, I've been going down the road of um, getting my GPU on my computer set up to work again so that I can go through and rapidly analyze a bunch of the digital RF stuff. Uh, and uh, I actually uncovered a bug in the CUDA code that is the uh, uh, fast Fourier transform stuff for uh, that, that is currently the Python approach for um, feeding data into uh, an, an FFT as I, I get it from H5PY. So that's, it goes from digital RF and I can read that data using H5PY and then I, sh I shove it into an FFT using the Python CUDA code and I found a bug in it. So anyway, I'm working with the Russian developers on that. So you know, it's 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 a it's a it's a laugh a minute here. Back to net. Well, fine business. Uh, it's great that you're finding bugs and getting them fixed. <laughs> Good. Um, oh shoot! It. I mean, move over here. You're still there. On... Uh, Hello. Oh, you're still there on, on one the of other your... computer. Well, we hear you, or did. Now, both of... Yes. I'm on the other computer. I see them both oh. computers. Um, we see them both. <laughs> Uh, okay. Oh, they're both working now. Yeah. I'll, I'll mute one. Oh. Okay. Can you hear me now? You're echoing. We can still hear you and see you in two different places. Okay. Well, next on this. How can you be two places at once when you aren't anywhere at all? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. That's that some fire sign theater. Okay. That boy, oh, they're really okay. getting themselves. Okay. Here, I'm going to. I muted one of you. He muted the other. Oh, boy. Yeah, he's got two they're speakers going, though. That's the problem. Okay. He's in two places, but we can't hear him. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm on the Linux machine and I have the Windows machine uh, muted. I was trying to make a backup. Uh, next on the list is Bob in for HY. Go ahead, Bob. Thanks, glad to be here. I uh, had a great time on the weekend. Thank you, Nathaniel, for a great thing. And like the uh, fellow before me, I enjoyed the poster sessions immensely. They were terrific. And it was really good to see all the young people getting involved. And kudos to you, Nathaniel, and everyone who's bringing them in. And for me, I'm lurking because I'm trying to learn everything I can about Tangerine SDR because I have a use for it. Later. Very good. Say, Bob, I found a picture of you on the ARDN website or newsletter that had a tremendous amount of COVID hair. Was that you? So uh, when we <laughs> shut down Virginia Tech and sent everybody home, I swore I would not shave my beard until uh, I got vaccinated. And the day I got vaccinated, I shaved the beard off. I haven't shaved in about five <laughs> days, so it's, gr it's growing back. But yeah, I had a COVID beard. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, I'm on the board of directors of uh, ARDC. Thank you. 
Uh, next on the list, we have Dan in for XWD, XWE, sorry. Okay, thank you, Dave, and hello, everyone. Um, I guess about the only thing I really accomplished this week, I unfortunately missed the uh, sessions, both Friday and Saturday, I was working at an excuse, and I'm kind of sorry I missed it. Anyway, um, I did work on a, I've, I've been working for about the last three months on a script to install Dream, the DRM or Digital Radio Mondial uh, client that runs in Linux. And I think it runs on the Mac and, and Windows as well. But I finally got it working. I have one little issue that I can't quite figure out if I install it on a new install, it works perfectly. If I install it on an install that has some other programs that I've also put on previously, it craps out during the compile. And I think that ham live is what's causing my issues. So I'm going to investigate that this week. Anyway, that's about it from here. Back to you, Dave. Well, fine business, Dan. And uh, by the way, you can watch it on YouTube if you want to go back and watch the talks. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, it's it's on a Ham Radio Now 2.0. Okay. Uh, next on the list is uh, Dave in uh, KD Zero EAG. Go ahead, Dave. Hello. Um, not a lot to report. I enjoyed the the um the conference but other than that not a lot to not a lot to say uh, well, for now fine business and next on the list is myself and then i'll skip him uh then it's uh dev am i off again ah is it me we got your audio is it me? Deb, it's your turn. It's my turn? Yes. Hello, good evening, everyone. So we had a, a good uh, workshop uh, Friday and Saturday. And I think we are uh, having good feelings about it, hearing good things about it. Uh, and uh, and we're, we're now, we're starting a new week here at Scranton. Other than that, there has been not much progress in the work. Uh, but it's, it's been a good workshop uh, by many accounts. Thank you. Well, I'm back on the uh, laptop, but uh, next, oh, I don't know what's going on with my Linux box. Let me turn it. Okay. So next on the list is, uh, let's see, is Dev. Dev, Dev just Dave gave James, uh, KG4 DSG. Go ahead, James. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I missed the Friday sessions because of work, but I'm slowly catching up with the uh, replays. And uh, from what I've seen so far, it's a very good presentation. So uh, with that, back to the group. Are you there, Dave? see us. He appears to be moving a little bit. Maybe I should just take over for the rest of uh, this. I think he's having internet problems, it looks like. Yeah, I think that's a good problem. idea. <clears throat> All right, uh, Ward uh, Hall. Ward, have, Ward Hall, have yeah. we heard from you yet? Let's see. Uh, no, good so evening. After James, we or FDEV, we have Hillman, KD2. Go ahead, uh, Kilman. Compete or word? <laughs> Should I go first? 
Go ahead, Go ahead. Kevin. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Hyomin Kim. Uh, nothing really particular to report this week. Um, although I really enjoyed the Hapsai workshop, and I like really thank thank uh, Nathaniel Frisell who organized this Hapsai workshop, which went really really great. And I was so glad to see uh, a lot of interest about the magnetometer. Um, and yep, I really uh, happy to see good uh, data from the, the newly developed magnetometers that will be used for our personal space weather station. So that's it for me and back to Matt. Okay, now I think I can hear. Um, let's see, after that, we got Dan, those people have talked. Uh, Jim K4BSE. Go ahead, Jim. I'd like to add my uh, congratulations for a great conference. I learned a lot. My head is still spinning from it. And uh, I've got to go back and review a lot of the uh, information. I downloaded a lot of the slides. I got to review that and listen to them. As far as uh, this project, I've been uh, working on that spreadsheet I started of um, uh, the various time stations around the world and um, got it fairly useful, I think, uh, at least for a first cut. I sent that to uh, Christina over the weekend and uh, I have not heard back from her yet. Um, but I kind of didn't expect to this soon. Um, I have uh, uh, looked at uh, the signals at the South Pole Station, McMurdo Sound. And there's a bunch of stuff that uh, they probably can hear down there. I uh, did a little bit of work on how do we reject signals if we have to? Uh, can we do it with a directional antenna? And the answer is a big fat maybe. Uh, worth uh, trying that loop uh, uh, that they sent uh, should be a good antenna for that. But um, I would just have to see a lot of the signals uh, are uh, do have some separation and bearing down there. But uh, then I listened to um, a, a presentation from the uh, QSO Today uh, uh, Hamfest by Eric Nichols, uh, had a very good presentation on the ionosphere. And he makes the point that as you get close to the poles, particularly, uh, the ionosphere just may be bending the signals so they could come in at some angle that's not related to the great circle. So that's going to make it interesting. Um, and I also uh, told uh, Christina that uh, if she still needed some help with uh, setting up a help desk for the um, uh, grape uh, as uh, people start assembling them, that I thought I could uh, probably handle that. Okay, back to that. Well, Jim, you got a big thumbs up from John and John's next on the list. So go ahead. I can use all the help I can get. <laughs> Spent most of last week uh, preparing my uh, ham site presentation. In fact, I'm gonna go back and review it to see how bad I did. Um, I also got a parts list to finally download correctly into the DigiKey BOM manager correctly. And I got that to, it was Joe. And I think he finally got it to work. He got his parts. He's now asking for an OS image. And so I'm going to concentrate on what Bill Engelke gave me for the upload scripts, get that working to a common one so I can distribute it to everybody. That way it all goes to the same place. They don't have to mess around with it. So that's this job's task or this week's task. Back to net. Well, fine business, John. And uh, next on my list is Scotty, WA2DFI. Go ahead, Scotty. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, Dave. <clears throat> yes, the uh, kudos to Nathaniel for another great HamSci conference was uh, the uh, posters and the chat rooms afterwards were awesome. And uh, while most of the science was uh, a bit over my head, it was great to listen to it and learn as much as I could from it. So it's 
Great to see uh, such a wide range of applications coming up here. Um, one thing that is, I did manage to nearly complete this week is the uh, clock module. I don't know, uh, Dave, you want to let me share my screen now or you want to wait till the, the afterwards? Well, why don't we get through the list and then let you share that? Okay. Anyway, that's uh, got that pretty much done. There's a few tweaks that need to be made to make sure that we have everything uh, addressed. And I've uh, been through going, basically going through a design review again to check everything, you know, check it twice, build it once kind of thing. And um, a couple of tweaks and then we'll be ready for that. And then we're going to move on to the data engine, which is already in CAD, but we had to, we're going to have to move some components around that are under the clock module to uh, guarantee that they're going to be able to mate together. And uh, then we'll be on onward. But the, uh, as you'll see when I show you the, the layout, did a pretty good job in matching up trace lengths and things like that. So it uh, looks like a pretty good job. L looked impossible from the rat's nest. And I told him he's got to stop making it look so easy or I'm going to keep giving him harder and harder ones to do. <laughs> so as if this wasn't hard enough. So that's about it for this week. Back to you, Dave. Fine business. And I believe next on the list is Joe. W7LUX. Go ahead, Joe. Well, thank you, and a very good evening to uh, everyone. Uh, I've been working with John um, and Nate OBJ on the uh, grape, and uh, uh, I've got enough parts uh, arrived today that I can probably put one together and get it going. Now I just need to figure out how to put all those little uh, microscopic parts on the uh, printed circuit board and hold them in place while I uh, nail them down there. But uh, that's that's pretty much it. Been super busy. Did not have time to do anything on the um, the ham side. The um, girlfriend uh, had to go to the ER, so uh, that was kind of busy there. Uh, back to you there, Dave. Well, fine business. Hope everything's uh, getting better. Uh, next on the list is Jonathan Rizzo, uh, KC three three E E Y. Go ahead, Jonathan. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I would like to congratulate uh, Nathaniel for a, another awesome uh, uh, ham sci. Uh, it it uh, went uh, pretty much close to perfect. And the uh, part that he was worried about the most, the uh, bre breakout rooms, I, I, uh, I thought that they went extremely well. There was a lot of really good discussion in the rooms. Um, a lot of really good discussion uh, on, on um, both days, and I, I really enjoyed it. And I'd uh, like to thank him for uh, involving me. Uh, other than that, um, I have one quick question that could probably be uh, addressed in general discussion. It's for Scotty. Um, I was wondering um, for the uh, clock that's that, um, that will uh, come from the clock module. Um, I, I was wondering um, about a uh, buffer um, because um, what I was going to do was I was going to feed the um, uh, clock signal uh, from the uh, uh, clock module into the buffer, and then the output of the buffer would drive the input of the um, ADD converter and the clock output pin on the leaf module to go back in to go into the FPGA. I was wondering if there was anything uh, special uh, that I should consider when choosing a, a buffer uh, other than um, a uh, single buffer module like an SOT uh, uh, 23 package. Um, other than that, uh, I don't have anything else. Uh, back to the net. Well, fine business, and I see Ward Hall. Did you get called yet? Ward? Oh, uh, briefly. I, I said hello to the group, and okay. uh, thanks for letting me join. Well, I my dropouts got me shuffled around a little bit. Yeah, uh, that's about the time it happened. Okay, and uh, and the problem is, as uh, Nathan Nathaniel knows, he 
these lists resort themselves every time somebody talks. So you got to be on your toes to keep track of who's been talked to and who's not. So next on the list is should be uh, John KJ six IBP. Go ahead, John. Um, well, I'm still a beginner at this. Uh, I've got lots of learning to do. Uh, but I, so far, I do know uh, the work you guys are doing on the hardware. Uh, even though I studied electronics for two years, it's still too advanced for me. Well, there are all kinds of things to do, technical at varying levels. So hang around and you might find something. And seems like you have a nice cat. Oh, yes. She's a nice kitty. Very good. Uh, next on the list should be uh, Michael, AA8K. Go ahead, Michael. Well, thanks very much. I enjoyed the uh, workshop. It was, uh, I was riveted to my chair. <laughs> um, one question I have for the group is, um, do I still need to keep making these recordings and posting them to tangerine uh, SDR or um, it is a duplication of the uh, Zoom recordings. The Zoom recordings are uh, significantly better. The only advantage I can see to keep posting them is if someone doesn't have Zoom. So I, I throw the question out to the group. Thanks very much. And for your information, uh, Michael spent over 10 years recording the open HPSDR uh, sessions every week. So he's got a long history of doing this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> wow, 10 years? Well, what are we, 10 years plus a couple of years of this? Oh, yes. That's more than that. We started HPSDR in like 2007, I think, or 2008. 2006 is uh, when we had had the Xilix uh, group. Right. But the, I'm thinking of the, the, the two boards that we produced, the production boards, came out in about 07, I think. Yep. And how many people so. here remember Phil Hartman? Oh, yes. Yes. Excellent contributions. Yes. So anyway, I wanted you to know that history about Michael. He's quiet, but he, he's <laughs> persistent. <laughs> so and, and just for the for my two cents, I think that the audio recordings are a good thing to have because I suspect that eventually the video recordings, as big as they are, will uh, they may go away or they may go somewhere obscure. But the I, I know I've I've sent several people over to the audio recordings who said all they need is to listen. They don't really need to see. Uh, yeah, I mean, nobody needs to see my ugly mug anyway, so the audio is what they want. Well, I had a number of Europeans when we shut down open HPSDR uh, uh, weekly meetings. Uh, several people said, what am I going to do on Saturday morning in England? <laughs> <laughs> They'd listened to the last the previous night's recordings. Mm. So. Anyway, we got, uh, I think uh, Tom is monitoring only, uh, KG6MKI. Oh, and then we have Tom McDermott. Go ahead, Tom. Oh, good evening, everyone. And Daniel, let me add my voice to the chorus of praises for Hamside. It was a great conference. Enjoyed it thoroughly. So you and the whole staff at the university did a great job. It was really wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Scotty, uh, I don't know if this week's appropriate or next. Um, do we need to discuss offline any receiver tweaks to match up with the uh, actual implementation of the data engine? I think you're muted. Later this week would be a good time because uh, the uh... Uh, leaf module and the RF module connectors are the next two things that we have to iron out to make sure all the IO is good on the data engine. Okay, just send me an email when you're ready. Okay, thanks. And have I missed anyone? 
So not hearing anything, I guess we're open for general discussion. Okay, I guess I can address uh, uh, John's question about the clock. Um, I would expect that you would receive the clock from the clock module and that you would probably um, buffer it twice. So in other words, you receive it on a receiver and then the output of your receiver would run to two other buffers. One would be a local one, one would be mine to keep the skew down between the FPGA and the ADD. And as far as what buffer you want to use, I, I would recommend using a differential uh, coming in because we can run it, make it, make it LVDS and uh, keep the noise down on the clock. And Tom McDermott might want to check in on this too, uh, but we have the capability to, to send LVDS clocks from the clock module, or we can do single ended too, it's programmable. So you can decide which you want to do. Um, to answer your question. Well, so, so would you, so um, what you're saying is, is that you would um, connect the, so the uh, clock coming from the clock module will connect to the input of two buffers and the output of one buffer would go to the ADD converter and the output of the other, other buffer would go to the clock out pin, right? You can do it that way, but typically uh, LVDS buffers are point to point. So you'd have a single buffer on your board that would receive the clock module clock. And then mm -hmm. that buffer would drive two buffers, one going to you, one going to me, so that they're basically this as coherently as coherent as possible with each other. Oh, okay. So then that would be a total of three LVDS buffers. Right, and you can use little bitty, you know, SOT23 type buffers if you can, that, that's fine. They don't have to be a big fancy clock chip because the, the, uh, the clock chip, it has a buffer on it on the clock module. So, but again, you're going across two connectors. So you really now, want to receive it with something. Now, Scotty, the, uh, why wouldn't the um, clock going to the FPGA be coming directly from the clock module? Uh, it could be, but I would rather have the clock that he uses because I want a coherent clock. Okay, so you want to pass through there. Right. So you'd have one LVDS receiver driving an LVDS driver that would then go to the FPGA. Right. right? And then he'd have also he'd have a local driver that would drive his A to, C, A to D converter on his board. Right. And that would not be LVDS. That's just, that's single-ended. Yeah. And so, I mean, you're going to end up with some skew there because, you know, LVDS versus uh, a single-ended clock. That's, I mean... It's, That's not a big deal because the uh, the M clock doesn't have to stay um, synchronous. It's the uh, the um, frame clock and bit clocks that have to right, stay well, synchronous. The thing is that the frame clock and the bit clock I'm going to generate off the clock he sends to me. So it, I, as far as the skew goes, I can't really find anything in the data sheet that says what the skew can be because all that matters is that you are exactly frequency locked with dividers that's correct that's handled within the a to d chip right. but but as far as the the onboard clock for onboard clock distribution for john's board i would look for an on semiconductor or a, a silicon you know si labs or one of those a, a one to two lvds driver so take an lvds in send one lvds out to me at the fpga and take one lvds in locally on his, his board. And that way you really minimize the, the edge transition skew between the two clocks. I still don't understand what the second LVDS driver is. The, the first one. Well, There's one receiver and one driver, but internally it's single ended. Well, it, if you have a different driver, in other words, you, you accept the clock from the clock module and you split it into two and one of them is LVDS and one of them is single-ended, it's going to probably be difficult to get those edges to line up. You don't have to. That's the point. You don't have to. Well, it's... The chip uh, takes care of it. Yeah. The but chip has synchronizers within it. That's fine. But, you know, keep the clock differential everywhere. And you keep but you can't... Out. No, but it, the chip doesn't take a differential clock. It's single-ended. Uh, I, I thought it was a differential input. No, no. no. 
Well, okay. Well, that, that, that answers that answers the question. That is no, like, but there, the the chip I would uh, recommend you look at is a um, uh, Tiny Logic uh, one twenty five. Um, whether it's HC one twenty five or I don't know if there's an L in the Z or something in there. Um, okay. But the the one twenty five is available in a, the SOT twenty three. And it is a high current driver and low propagation delay. So okay, that's single. That's a place to start. Right? That's a single ended in and out. Right. But it, it will buffer the internal clock in a way similar to the LVDS driver headed out. Well, so so then, um, if I'm going to use LVDS. In, um, so so it'll 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 come in LVDS, go into an LVDS um, driver, a, a buffer receiver, or, or a. Go ahead. Yeah, you you have a LVDS receiver taking it from the clock module. Then internally, it will drive an LV LVDS driver back out to the FPGA, and then the okay. single-ended buffer to the A, A to D chip. Oh, all right. Uh, so, so then there's there's um, there. So, um, I would have to get a. Uh, I would need to convert from LVDS to single-ended to to uh, drive the uh, HC125 buffer. Yeah, well, that's what the receiver does. That's Do what a LVDS number? receiver is. It goes from LVDS to single-ended. Oh, I see. Okay, all right. Do you have any part number in mind for uh, that too? LVDS receiver and driver, yeah, uh, 90 C, um, 31 and 32. Okay. Start. All right. Those are four ways. Um, I'm thinking we might be able to find a one receiver, one I'll driver. Find a single, type chip. single, yeah. But that's the. Those are the characteristics you're looking for. Okay. Uh, let me actually see the part that I use because I do use these. While you're looking that up, Scotty, does the is the clock module itself simple enough to replicate, or is that something it would be cheaper to make better as a plug-in board for the grate? Uh, you you want you want a plug-in board? You don't oh. want to redo this. This is a, an eight-layer board. Okay. So what's but, the connector to it? Uh, it's an M.2 connector. Ooh. Which is is a uh, you can see, well I'll show it to you here in a second, but uh, it's uh, yeah I'm familiar with the M.2 memory. Yeah, it, well it's it's like the SSD connector. Right. So it's 75 pin, about yay wide. So. Wow. But for you, I mean, you're not even going to use half of the pins. So. I still have to have the socket to, to tie it on the board. You still have to have the socket to tie on the board, but the socket. The good news is the socket is a dollar. So if we picked it because it was cheap and it will is able to transmit high speed signals. So since they could run PCI Express over it, so okay. so that's why we picked it because it was inexpensive. So is the documentation or the schematic for the clock board the same place that I found the remote board that had the driver for the I squared C bus? And... No, it's not anywhere yet because we are still working on it. Once we get it finalized, oh, okay. put up there. You want me to take a peek at it if you weren't happy to do that? Okay. Um, I did you know, get I a copy. David, of... I was gonna send David a copy of it too when I get it to the point where it's not in flux. Okay. I did get a copy of the other schematic. It looks like what I have to replicate is the uh, the long driver for the wire and I was going to ask if I could disconnect the interrupt and just connect that to plus five so I have two plus five and two ground signals. Oh on the magnetometer? Yeah for the extension uh, cable. Yeah you can strap the magnetometer uh, to do use plus five and just ignore the interrupt. In fact 
the, there's some discussion still on the on the rev e magnetometer which will be the, the production one whether we're even going to leave the interrupt on there at all because it seems to be the consensus is that nobody's going to ever use it so you might as well just make the board simpler and get rid of it and then not have to worry about well did i strap it right or did i put the right part in the right place or and just get two five volt lines get a little bit less loss get a little bit less drop in the lines yeah that could make a huge time. difference yeah i mean i saw those uh diagrams that jules had and uh, we do actually have that extra capacitance on the board so the traces that he showed we we ours should be the smooth one because we have that extra 200 mics so hopefully that took, that was Jules' suggestion to add that. Either Jules or Dave, one of the two, said you need more capacity. So we put a lot more on there. The other thing yeah. I forgot to report is I was working with Ben on that code, the C code for the Grape Gen 2. And we just about have it working where we're getting timings off of the rising and falling edge of the 1 PPS. And I've written a program to capture to six decimal places in time, the rising and falling edge timing so I can get a distribution of how much jitter we got using the hardware clock being looked at in a C program. And then I'm gonna rewrite and replace the code to look, instead of looking at the hardware edge, is to look at the clock system clock and see how bad the jitter is on that, which I'm expecting to get a lot worse. And then we at least compare the two and have something to look at. And I'm waiting for Jules to come up with a, uh, you know, a 20 board array of magnetometers. <laughs> <laughs> mm, I think he had. I would 20. encourage him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he's going to have like the trident, right? He's going to have three pipes coming down, uh, the cross connection, and, and two magnetometers in each one. It's going to be a trident <laughs> in each axis. <laughs> and, and Scotty, he is working on a, one of those thousand dollar magnetometers too. <laughs> Oh geez, okay. <laughs> well, I, it looked to me like at the at the the conference the other day that uh, we compare pretty favorably to the high buck magnetometers. Oh, oh yes. So that's good news. I'm so really you... surprised the manufacturer didn't recognize the temperature coefficient of the uh, ferrite material in the cores. Well, it, it claims it's temperature compensated, but it isn't really. That's that's hard to do. I've tried to do that. And it's next to impossible because it varies so much. That's wasn't that the idea why Dave wanted to put those on there was uh, to have an yep. well, two checks on each or a check on each board. Well, our check now is to bury it in the ground. So that takes care of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that does unless you have water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> or unless the dog digs it up and brings it inside for you. Yes. <laughs> so. Okay, so I can sh you can let me show my screen here, and I'll do a super quick review of the of where we are with the clock module. I'd keep an eye on your chip suppliers. Renesis burned up another fab today. Who did? Renesis. Oh, no. Yeah, 300 millimeter facility. Jeez, we're overseas or in the in United Japan. States? In Japan. Japan, great. Yeah. Okay, so this is the uh, assembly drawing of the top layer. So the, uh, the Z GPS, the high performance one is here. U1 is on the right-hand side. The clock distribution and the synthesizer chip is this uh, 65 is the pin number. It's actually U4, as you can see, it's upside down there in the middle of the chip. And our clock oscillator is up here on the right, Y1, upper right. And as you can see, I'll show you the back side. This is what's on the back of the board. So you can see how, why my CAD guy was whining at me because of all the stuff that we have to put on the back. So we're going to have to make sure when we plug this into the data engine that this area down here is a keep out because these capacitors here are like two and a half millimeters tall. They're like 470 microfarad SMT guys. And you really, that's, that's what's called out by the clock chip. So we really need to have those on there. And they're 
the, they can't go on the front because of the routing. So they ended up going on the back where we only have four millimeters of space to the to data engine. So that gives us, you know, maybe a millimeter of something that goes underneath it. But if we put anything tall underneath it, it'll interfere. So we have to be careful. Like for instance, if we had another 47 white cap on the data engine that was located, then the board wouldn't fit. So we're making sure that that's gonna work. And then generally for, for John Ackerman, who's gonna lay out a carrier board to accept this board and make it into a, a uh, instrument for your ham shack, he's just gonna have to generally keep out from underneath it, which will be pretty easy when you've got a big board to plug it into. When you're plugging it into two high density boards, plugging them together, then you have to be pretty careful. And I can show you, uh, here is the, whoops, that's not it. The primary side is this, this is the layout. And you can see down here, all these uh, squigglies. These are differential pairs and they're all matched to length. So this one here, the four across the bottom and this one here are all matched to the same length. So these, and, and I believe what he did is he took this one and this one and matched them and this one, and this one to match them. So we really have three matched groups of traces. The data engine uses these four down here. These are for the two RF modules and the, um, um, the low frequency board, the VLF module and the um, uh, FPGA. So we could theoretically make this, the, the FPGA one, the same frequency as the one going to the clock module, but that's, I'd rather have one coming, sorry, going from the VLF module, but I'd rather have something coming back coherent from the VLF module that says, here's the clock and send me everything based on that clock. And then it's one coherent channel. Anyway, uh, the backside, so, okay, so the, this is the ground plane, that's the second layer. And then in, uh, did I say this was eight layers or six layers? He managed to cram it into six. So, so there's a primary layer is parts and traces. Secondary layer is parts and traces. This is the back layer. Then you can see there's a plane above and or below each one of those. And then sandwiched in between those two planes are two more trace layers. So you got basically top, ground plane, trace, trace, ground plane, secondary. And by ground plane, I mean ground or VCC plane because they have approximately the same impedance to each other because there's tons of this. There's, there's like, uh, I, don't, I forget how many bypass caps are on this board, but there's a lot for its size. Because if you look at, uh, this is the composite with the top and the bottom shown together. This is only like 30 millimeters across. I mean, this is an inch and a half maybe. So it's really not. Anyway, to go back to the ground layer, we got that layer there. Then we got a basically vertical trace layer with a, a, a power plane cut out in it. And then we have the horizontal trace layer. These are the two very center layers. And then we have a, a power plane layer. And I believe that five volts is this plane here. And three volts is this plane here. There's this several three volt planes. There's an analog plane, two analog planes and a digital plane. And so they're cut up into areas. And then the secondary side of course is what's on the back, so. So that's where we are, it's pretty much, when, when I saw that, I was pretty impressed that he had actually been able to, to do it. It doesn't look like it was too hard, yeah, but Scotty, of course, yeah. The LVDS clocks out, those are uh, standard LVDS? They are, uh, that's a good question there. What, whatever the 5345 is, they're programmable to be either single-ended or differential. And I think it says they can do LVDS, LV Peckle, um, single-ended CMOS or okay. differential CMOS, I think there's four things that they can do. Okay, okay. The receiver uses standard LVDS. On the FPGA? Uh, no, the receiver, the receiver module, the um, oh, okay. converter yeah. chip uses standard LVDS. So the clock is differential? Absolutely. Oh, I thought the clock was single-ended. Okay, it's not not on the HF receiver. It's absolutely. Oh, no, wait, wait, wait. You're talking about the HF receiver module, not Jonathan's VLF receiver. Correct. The HF receiver. Okay. Module. 
Yeah, because the clocks to to you to the RF module slots are they're they're separate. One right. one of these will go to one slot, one will go to the other, one will go to the the uh, uh, leaf module, and one will go over to the FPGA on the data engine. Those four. Okay, just wanted to make sure they're standard LVDS. That's good. Okay, and the uh, from what I can tell, the LVDS receivers on the FPGA already have their termination resistors internal. So we do not need to put the 64 or however many parallel resistors, shut resistors to get LVDS termination. Right, yeah, that those are programmable in the FPGA. I believe you yep. can turn them on or off. Now the transmit ones, only certain modules, only certain banks have true LVDS transmitters. The other ones you have to put resistors on the board to do that, to make it into an LVDS transmitter. Okay. So when, my, I looked at, when I looked at the data sheet, it looked like the receivers were very um, standard oriented. Yeah, and, and pretty much every differential input is an LVDS receiver. Okay, but good. Only the, the transmitters are only on the bottom two banks of the FPGA, which means there are not enough of them to feed both RFM0 and RFM1 with transmit ports, which means what's going to happen is one of the ports is going to be more suited to a transmitter module than the other. They're not orthogonal because one of them doesn't have transmitters going to it. The other one does. So, but since the receiver, the HF receiver can go in either slot, we'll just use that one for the one for the receiver and the one that needs to be a transmitter will be a transmitter. Then the other one will be the receiver. So it won't make any difference. And it's, it's amazing when you have 500 IOs, and you think you have no problems because you have so many <laughs> IOs and then you run out and then you find out, oh, wait, those IOs can only be used for one purpose. And those IOs have to be one and a half volts. And then those right. IOs are, and pretty soon you don't have any IOs left anymore. Yeah. And it seems like a lot, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, been there, done that. Yeah. The six of you, Scotty, is the footprint for the medium performance GPS the same as this footprint? Uh, the medium performance one is on the secondary side, and it is these two rows of pins here, 24 pins. Oh, okay. I could dip. And so the answer is no, it's not. I wish that it was. I also wish that, notice on the primary side, see all these pads here? Yep. These are all ground pads on the uh, high performance GPS. Now, if they didn't have all those stinking ground pads in the middle, I could take the secondary one and I could stick it in between. Yep. And I could overlap them and it would be because we're not going to install both at the same time. Right. So they're either or, but you can't do it. So you see all these dots here, these vias, these are all ground vias grounding those pads that are on the other side of the board. Uh, yeah. So at first glance, my CAD guy told me right out of the gate, he says, forget it. We can't do this. So. I can understand job. why I said that. <laughs> it was my job to convince him that it was possible. And that's the thing is he, he's pretty good at it. So if you can convince him and he's, he buys into it, he'll do it. So once we got to this placement here that we're, that we, uh, we came up with here and we had the parts that we put on the back, he said, I can do it. And he did. Once, once he's convinced. Yeah, once he was able to straddle those ground yeah. pads, that made all the difference in the world. So one of the things, and maybe this is a good question for you, John, is that see these three SMAs, mm -hmm. the bottom one is a one PPS output. The top one is a 10 megahertz reference output. Mm -hmm. The center one is the GPS antenna. Now, the problem is that underneath these right here is a USB three co connector from the data on the data engine. Well, it will fit underneath the, the, these, this connector here but there is no way that you can leave it that way because you won't be able to get your fingers in there and tighten the, the nut or plug in the USB. It would be one or the other. So what I'm thinking is we got to change this connector instead of an edge launch off the edge of the board, a right angle through hole on the top of the board to raise it up away from the USB connector. So the question then becomes, if we make this an SMA right angle, it's too deep and it runs into all these parts in here and we'll have to it's a big mess. Yep. But if we use an MMCX right angle, it's small and it fits right in this footprint right here. So the question is, do you know what kind of dual band antenna John had picked out 
to for us to use with this? I do not know. Because apparently the antenna is a limiting factor because there's not very many dual band antennas. I believe that. And also, and so, does the uh, 1 PPS and the 10 megahertz come to the edge connector as well? Yes, it does. Oh, good. Good, good. Good, good, good. good. Yeah. yeah, lots of extra things come to the edge connector that we don't use on the data engine, but somebody will want. We actually have two 10 megahertz output, two 1 PPS outputs. We have one that can be, if, if you were to make one of these boards with an FPGA on it, then you could actually adjust the one PPS with the FPGA and have a processed one PPS if you wanted. And we also have the ability to accept a reset and to generate a reset so that if you, at some point, we're going to come up with a, a new clock module that will allow you to synchronize multiple data engines to within about two clock periods at 122 megahertz. So you're going to have to have a distribution system that has a reset that goes out that is going to be distributed to all of the data engines and it's going to be fed through the clock module and synchronized that way. And I think if we do it right, we can get within two clocks. And, and the thing is, it will, it will be one or two clocks and it will stay that way. So it'll be a phase offset, but it'll be continuous. It won't be jumping back and forth because once you synchronize, then you'll be synchronized. Makes sense. Theory, anyway, they never really were successful at that too much with the uh, HPSDR. And I think part of the problem was that they didn't actually meet critical timing. And if you don't meet critical timing, all you have to have is one hiccup and you miss one clock. Now you're off by two. Yep. And it happens again. You're off by one or three and then it, it moves around. And depending on how close your timing is, that could happen more or less often. It just becomes a statistical thing, right? And that drives you insane. <laughs> yeah, and it did. <laughs> and that was one of the problems they really wanted to try hard to fix. And yeah. the problem is that the LVDS clock on the receiver board, on the Mercury board, was an LVDS. It's a point-to-point -point clock. So although they did have kind of a, a jury rigged system where they could take one clock and feed it to multiple LVDS inputs, it really was a hack because it wasn't, it, it was... The only reason it worked is because the, the cables are that long. Oh, okay. And it really wasn't the right way to do it. It wasn't designed to do that. So, but we're keeping this in mind here because I think that there'll be some crazy person who will want to, uh, you know, synchronize eight clock modules or eight, eight, eight DEs together and get oh, yeah. four channels per 32 synchronous channels. I mean, who knows, but we don't want to preclude the, preclude this we want to be able to do it looks good though nice work thanks it was a long time coming i can really appreciate that Definitely. oh and especially when you when you saw it at the beginning you just go like oh my god how's he going to do this <laughs> and and you know the problem is when my cad guy gives up on me then i'm stuck because if this guy can't do it then forget it yeah so but like i told him he keeps once you create a miracle then miracles are expected so then every one has to be done so they and they don't get I, I told them all the easy jobs are already farmed out so we, we have only hard jobs left <laughs> so. yeah sadly at keithley all the analog stuff when i was doing the uh, really low current the cad guys didn't have the background to do it so i had to do all the board layouts oh and yeah, board was hard and trip because you know you get dielectrics that are too conduct. You know the board material is too conductive, so you have to work with that by putting slots in. And yeah, it's it's yeah. A, it's a true truly an art, and it takes takes a lot of oh yeah, I can't do that type of things, and oh yeah, you can't do that. And <laughs> Speaking of that, later, you finally get it. <laughs> one well, the more you do it, the more you can the more you can do it, right? Yep. Yeah, it's one of those. But speaking of that, if you look up here in the upper right, this is where our clock oscillator is. And we're trying to pull a little bit of a trick here by the putting some, isolation. these are thermal slots that we put yeah. in between the planes. And I, I've got to get with my CAD guy because he's got a problem here. Yeah. I, I, I don't want this, these conductive paths, thermal right. paths. He's got to break this. Yeah, yep. I want this electrically connected to ground with a trace, but I don't want a big yeah. thermal flow there. Yeah. 
and then you go to the next plane. He's yeah, got. You have, to, you have to think in three dimensions, and he's only yep. thought in, on the top layer. And part of the problem is he may have traces that run through here that he can't. Yeah. He doesn't want to cross into no plane or a cross plane, so you got to be careful doing that. So we may have to rearrange some things to get this this thermal plane out of here because I don't like it. And then on the bottom, it's there's no plane. And in the two trace layers, you can see there's no plane. There's a, a single trace. That's fine. But this is not going to fly for the ground, I think. that's Yeah, on the uh, DMM 7510 that I did at Keithley, it's a seven and a half digit DMM. I did the reference module and I made a thermal isolation thing in the center of the board and everything was connected with the serpentine connection and all the routes had to go on that serpentine. Uh -huh. And then I did help. Oh yeah, because I was able to heat the whole inside with resistors and I was able to hold it to a tenth of a degree at you know 40C and actually have a PID loop running to control it, even with air blowing on it. It worked really well. But the trick yeah. was that long serpentine length is what gave me the thermal isolation from the board. Yeah. Well, the you thing is if you can get it, it this, what you've got here won't work. Pardon me? You're trying to thermally isolate it. Right, right. But if we could thermally isolate this nearly completely and then blow some air across it then we the the air will be the primary cooling uh mechanism and you want the idea is if the rest of the board heats up out here i don't heat the oscillator up and then if i blow air across it i'm going to get this is going to be cooled and it's going to be much more stable than it will be if it has this it's actually going to follow the, the board air cooling around it um if you really wanted to thermally control that you could put you know resistors on there and heat it it's not hard to yeah. do well one of the things one of the options that we have you look here is right up here this connection right here is an a uh, ufl connector so if you really need to get it off the board take it off the board and then you okay. can put it in an oven you can put it far away you can put it with its okay. own fan or whatever so we do have a contingency plan in case it's supposed to be highly temperature compensated, so it's not supposed to matter mm -hmm. in the small small excursions that we are going to have. But yeah, it, once it settles down, it's usually pretty are, good. But, Scotty, what are the components that are right above the TCXO? Up here? Yeah. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think. These are uh, buffers. To uh, I'm not sure what they're for. I don't remember. What I'm thinking is if you could get the uh, TCXO to a board edge. Up here? Yeah. Of course, the, the flow from the TCXO is across this way and down into the oscillator. So moving it up would be not as good unless we, we maybe we put it up and to the left and then move right. the, uh, the MCX over here. I mean, the right. over Something here. Something like that. Yeah. But get it to a board edge and you've got one edge already taken care of and you're getting it out of the way of yeah i'm not trees. sure you know these are probably led buffers which means they could just be dispensed with as far as i'm concerned because <laughs> you're, if it's in a box what do you need leds for oh you gotta have blinky lights i mean that's required mm. oh we have other blinky lights we just don't need these two <laughs> hey scotty i am blinky beat. lights and to, tin hats i need to take off Okay, yeah, you look like you're about uh, asleep at the about wheel. To crash there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this looks really good. So I'll just leave you in charge, okay, Scotty? Okay, thanks. And I have to go pretty quick here, too, because I'm getting my second COVID shot tonight. Ooh, Ooh that's okay. insane. Ooh. Oh, that. don't so, want to be late for that. Don't look for me anytime the rest of the week if it happens like uh, it did last uh, time. I've uh, got three more days on my two weeks after. Yeah, you know, we actually this is uh, the fourth week for me because uh, my wife was sick, so we put it off for a week, mm. and so I pretty um, much we have to do it. Oh, this week. you got yeah. Pfizer? Yeah. Uh, so I did Moderna, Scotty. but I've had my second. But I didn't two didn't have symptoms after the second shot. We didn't have any symptoms after the second shot. So okay, good because I I had terrible symptoms after the first one. I didn't mm. was not happy. Yeah, oh, yeah, was a sore arm. Scotty, I'm joining you on Thursday. You're joining me on Thursday? No, I'm doing the same thing on Thursday. Oh, okay. You're shot on Thursday. Okay, good. That's the second. Yep, second one of Great. Pfizer. 
So anyway, I'm pretty much done anyway. I just uh, that's a good suggestion, yeah, though, good. David, to, to see what we could do there. I know the CAD guy will try to shoot me, but if these are just LEDs, <laughs> I'm really oh, not he... worried about it because I'll just take them off. And the more he grouses, the happier he is. <laughs> well i've already told them easy is out the window this all this stuff's hard That's, from now on so you know yeah I, you're gonna just have to keep challenging him yeah i think the data engine's gonna do it because it's got all those differential pairs going to the rf module uh -huh. and there's way way more of them than are on here <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? looks good scotty i just I noticed myself, something. So. You see this dot right here that's the pin one designator for this jumper, and it's it's in midair. Yep. <laughs> it's called the virtual dot. Virtual. Well, dot. he had, he hasn't gone through and moved those things yet. Yeah. No, he he says he's got cleanup to do. This is just yep. the, the first yeah, that's pass just and everything routed. First placement. You don't worry about that at the first yeah. part. Well, yep. it's past the first placement. It's first it's first yep. routing complete. So, and I already yeah, made, changed, changed some things on the back connect of the connector because yep. I wanted to. Make sure that the grounds were opposite each other on the M.2 connector. Even though they're offset, I still wanted them orthogonal. And I want to use the same power and ground pinouts on the leaf connector as we use on this connector so that if you plug one board in the wrong slot, you don't burn anything up. Because you mm -hmm. physically could do it. I mean, even you have to be a moron to do it. But, you know, we're all going to do it sooner or later. And then you're going to go, crap, my $300 clock modules burn out. And so we're going to prevent that. Yep. Yep. And John, the the same. I did the same thing as you did with your uh, layout, guys. I was uh, doing audio uh, mm. layout, and I would sit right with them uh, because they didn't understand the yeah. uh, the routing. Um, they were happy to uh, have the help, but well, I've been know. working with this guy for about thirty years, mm -hmm. so he and he learns pretty fast, and he remembers stuff. So he'll actually come up to me and he'll say, are you sure you wanted this connected up this way? Because this doesn't look right. And sure enough, he finds errors. So it's that's good to have a, a, another pair of eyes. Oh, that's excellent to have that kind that's of guy. What you want. Yeah. That's definitely what you yeah. want. Yeah, so this is the best CAD guy I've ever worked with, including all the ones at Motorola who are pretty darn good too. But well, I just I'm going to have to leave here. So seven threes yeah. look good. And okay. Thanks. Catch you a little later. When I got to take off, John, I, I, got, I got to go get I'm, shot. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not long behind you. So uh, yeah. I'm going to say think, bye too. Yep. 73. All right. 73. Good work. All right. Good luck 73. Keep in touch. I'll be next week. I'll bye. email you about it. So. See you next week.